Thank you all for coming. Uh, you've entered, if you don't know it, into the session on funding and sustaining online learning. And if that's not where you intended to be, then feel free to get up and, and find your, your new location. Uh, I'm pleased to, uh, to be with a set of colleagues here who have a, a great deal of expertise in this particular area. Um, we have, starting from the left, uh, Marie Sinney from the University of Maryland. We have uh, TJ uh, Bliss from the Hewlett Foundation. And then immediately to my left, uh, Jeff Ubois, who is from the MacArthur Foundation, who um, reminds me before we uh, started talking that he is speaking as TJ Ubois and not necessarily the MacArthur Foundation and this particular panel. Um, so what we're planning to do is uh, have a few introductory remarks from each of the, of the speakers and, um, and then have a conversation. And the intention is to have a conversation amongst us, but invite you into that conversation as, the, as it progresses. And so, at least from my perspective, I would be perfectly happy if someone wants to interject um, throughout the, uh, the session. And if you do, just simply raise your hand and wave it around a little bit so that my poor peripheral vision actually gets to see it. And uh, we'll try to get, um, get either a microphone to you or at least get um, uh, your, converse, your question repeated so it can be recorded. And by the way, I'm Phil Long uh, from the University of Texas at Austin. And, um, and I'm uh, pleased to be moderating this session. So I'll start on the far left. Uh, and Marie, we give you a minute or two, and we'll try to keep this brief so that we can actually have a conversation. Okay, it's green. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, as Phil said, my name is Marie Sini. I'm actually the provost at a particular campus at the University of Maryland. It's University of Maryland University College. And I call that out because um, we have been uh, in the area of educating adult students since 1947, so we're very focused on adult students, not a residential campus. And at this point, we have 85,000 students around the world, and many of them, the majority, take most of their courses and programs online. And so when we talk about online education, we actually don't primarily mean MOOCs. We sort of see MOOCs as a, as a, um, oh, a later, uh, almost uh, not, not a secondary version of online education, but uh, very different than what we've been doing for the many years that we've been in online education since 1997, I think, is when we really started and got into it. Um, so what I think we've been talking about, what we all will be able to contribute, and certainly would love to hear from all of you, but I, what's very interesting to me is this intersection between what is online education, what are MOOCs, MOOCs are not the first instance of online education. I think we all know that. And those of us who have been doing, it's interesting to call it traditional online education, um, sometimes wonder about what people think about the whole MOOC world because uh, our class, the largest any of our classes are online uh, are 30 students. And so we have been doing a very different model for all of this time. And if you, we actually would love to talk through some of these uh, uh, little boxes on the slides because I think the story, while this is very helpful, the story is really more um, interesting and um, not quite as straightforward. For example, um, I think MOOCs really helped us all think about open educational resources and really opening up courseware. But you don't have to have a MOOC in order to open up your materials. Uh, you can certainly do it without a MOOC. We just hadn't thought in those terms before MIT said, let's just put everything out there. Um, so that's just one example, one thing I would like to you know, perhaps think about. In terms of funding, I know we have funders here, but I also think that institutions have to think through internal funding. We can't live on grants. Grants will not sustain us, but what will sustain us, and I think the, the leaders of our institutions have to really be thinking about this, and I don't know how many presidents and provosts we have here, but they're the ones who need to be thinking about this. What forms of education are the forms of the future for their students? Will it be blended learning? Will it be some form of MOOCs? Will it always be face-to-face -face with some sort of online behind it? But we have to think in terms of institutions and how we fund not just building buildings, but the technology for the kinds of best um, 
learning models for the future. And a, a lot of presidents and provosts are not educated to think like this. It's not their fault. It's just not part of any kind of program to pre prepare our presidents and our provosts. But we've got to think in those terms because whether it's online, MOOCs, blended, it's not going away. It shouldn't go away. And it's really, I think, the future of education is to think through for each institution what are the best modalities for the students that we serve. Okay. Thank you. TJ? Yeah, so hi, I'm TJ. And I am speaking on behalf of myself and the Hewlett Foundation. You can tweet at me or at the Hewlett Foundation. Don't do that with Jeff, though. Thank you. Um, so I am not a funder of MOOCs. MOOCs are not the thing that I fund. Um, though I have funded people to do MOOCs in a couple of instances, and you're going to hear a bit about that um, this afternoon when Mary Lou and I speak with some others. Um, I primarily focus on open educational resources. And as an example of that, uh, none of us had slides for this presentation, but George's slide from this morning uh, seemed like a very appropriate one, so asked if we could reuse it and, uh, and put it up here. We, we don't agree with everything on this slide as we've discussed it, but it's, it's a pretty good snapshot of kind of how things have rolled out since the late 90s. Um, but it, so if you look over here, there's this idea of open content that came about, um, which really was came out of the open source software. There's a missing line there. But this idea of open educational resources and how um, we think about the word open is something that um, I think about a lot. So open is defined um, by the Hewlett Foundation as a resource, an educational resource that is licensed in such a way that you can reuse it, revise it, remix it, redistribute it. So this licensing idea is really important. The use of the term open in MOOCs traditionally, we can say traditionally about MOOCs now, has it been around long enough, um, is not the definition of open that Hewlett uses. And so we've kind of had this weird relationship with MOOCs um, because there's a lot of good that come from MOOCs and we recognize that. So I'm not going to speak about the sustainability of MOOCs, um, but I think I'm going to talk a bit about the sustainability of, of innovation, the sustainability, and what the role of philanthropy is in sustainability. This is something that I've given a bit of thought to, not enough, of course, but um, one that's in, worth discussing. So when I think about online education in general, uh, and MOOCs as a subset of that, and the role of open educational resources in online education, and there's a heavy role for open educational resources to play in online learning, and then when I think about sustainability, I get really confused. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not certain what to think about that um, outside of the context of our ongoing educational endeavor. So. I don't believe that philanthropy has a strong role to play, traditional philanthropy like private foundations, in sustainability of these new modalities of teaching. I think philanthropy's best role is to catalyze innovation. I mean, we see ourselves as society's risk capital, people who are willing to put money somewhere, not expect a return. So we're willing to put things uh, into riskier businesses and riskier ideas and riskier innovations. And, and that's important, I think, for people to recognize that when something becomes mainstream or becomes default, that's a time when philanthropy typically wants to get out of the way. Uh, and I, I think MOOCs are starting to get there. There's some really intriguing business models around MOOCs themselves. There are good business models around online education. And um, I think it's important for us to understand those. And I don't know a lot about those business models themselves. Uh, but in terms of the role of philanthropy and sustainability, uh, that those, those are some of my thoughts. Um, the other thing I would say is that I recognize that sustainability is very difficult. It takes, it takes a lot of work to get anything to be sustainable, and most things don't become sustainable. Most new innovations don't cross the chasm from people who are really excited, their, their early adopters, the innovators, to everybody using it. Uh, but once you cross that chasm, then, um, then, then you move forward and you innovate off of that. And we see some of that happening here. Like we see, we see um, we're starting to see open educational resources themselves as a thing cross the chasm. I think online education has crossed the chasm in a lot of ways. It's become the, the primary modality of education at some entire 
institutions mm -hmm. of higher education. Um, it's also crossing the chasm in K-12. Uh, so I, I'm not as concerned about the sustainability of online education. Maybe I should be, and maybe somebody here will <laughs> raise their hand and say, you should be really concerned about this. Um, I focus more on, on new innovations and things that are, that are coming next and what are the opportunities and what, what does this mean for the future. Um, I think the other thing that I would say, um, since I have the microphone, is I'm, I was thinking back to last year's Learning with MOOCs uh, conference at MIT. And um, the, theme, the theme from that conference was interesting. The theme there, the theme that I caught, was that an important piece of the puzzle here, if, 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 if MOOCs want to get to sustainability, then MOOC producers, faculty, MOOC providers, they really need to pay attention to all of the work that people like Marie have done over the past 20 years, and others who are um, involved in online education. Online education is not new. MOOCs are sexy and they make the news, but online education itself is not new. There are education researchers who are um, studying, have been studying online education for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And I think as these two things merge back together a little bit, um, and I'm sure that there are a lot of MOOC providers and MOOC producers that do think about this, but there certainly need to be more. And this was a theme, people said it last year. They said at the end, oh, wow, we really should be paying attention to this body of work and body of research mm -hmm. uh, to, to really maximize the potential for learning with MOOCs. And then, I mean, you've got people like George who are, who are out here saying there's even more that we should be paying attention to with MOOCs. So I think, I think that's where I'll stick, and I look forward to questions about and challenging my thoughts that philanthropy really shouldn't be involved in the sustainability of something like online education or MOOCs. Okay, Jeff. Um, well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me in. Um, I think my two colleagues just summed up my presentation. Marie got it in four words. Um, grants won't sustain us. Sigh. Um, I, could everybody hear that? Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, TJ's point that uh, foundations exist to catalyze things or to cause innovation to happen or to cause systems to change. So I was urged at dinner last night to talk more about what funders are looking for and what they're avoiding. And one thing I think most foundations look for when making grants is leverage on existing systems. And that does make OER very appealing. It's a kind of uh, systemic change that might improve educational quality and access and cut costs over time. So it's an area of experimentation and growth and optimism, and that's, that's very hard to ignore. Um, one of the other things that, that strikes me um, about this conversation, and it's kind of to TJ's point, uh, is the relative scale of commitments. So you think about um, the educational system and how much money is involved in that, and then you think about philanthropy and how much money is actually involved in that, and you hear about a foundation with a $10 billion endowment, and you think that's a lot of money, but that's really, you know, that's less than a year for the New York public school system, right? And so you could burn all the endowments, the top 10 foundations, in pretty short order uh, if you applied them to direct typical educational expenses. And so I think that that is, um, uh, it's, it's hard to get the scale right in some of these conversations, and mm -hmm. I think some of the hopes or the the um, wishes that are layered on to the philanthropic sector are not always realistic for that for that for that reason. Um, the other thing that I'm struck by, I uh, worked in libraries, museums, and archives before I had this job, and it seemed to me very obvious that uh, open resources were the greatest thing in the world, and that we should be working hard to provide universal access to them. And it was uh, socially very tractable to to do that, and it was an obvious it was an obvious thing to do. And I think anyone who gets very close into an area of work begins to see and feel very strongly about the intrinsic value of what they're doing. And it's easy to start making arguments or want to convince people of the intrinsic value of, of the work that's, that's being pursued. And I think that happens with open educational resources. It happens with MOOCs. You know, there is a, there's a new truth in the world and you, know, you want to share it with people. Um, but that's not always a, a great way of uh, pushing funding systems around, um, particularly those that are comparing um, education with coral reefs, with nuclear security, with climate change. You know, the, the argument about intrinsic value, I, I won't say it's unimportant and I won't say it's weak, but it needs to be accompanied by something else. And, and that, um, 
is usually something in economic terms, and educational materials and MOOCs are pretty amenable to that. In a sense, you can, you can do uh, cost comparisons, and you can look at the value of education as it is, and as it, or the cost of education as it is now, and the cost as it might be um, with MOOCs for people, and you can think about how that brings education to a broader and more diverse population, and that's, that's all good when you're working with funders who think about things like, uh, you know, cost per beneficiary. But, you know, the, 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 flip, the flip side of that, I think, is um, do you, do you want to conduct your arguments in those terms all the time? So um, a couple of years ago, I was, I'm in Chicago now, and I was walking down Michigan Avenue, and there were all these beautiful trees that had been planted, and an enterprising arboretum in Illinois tagged all the trees with these big signs that said, this tree contributes $109 annually to the local economy. This tree, which is a little bigger, contributes $120 to the local economy. <laughs> and, you know, they had kind of an analysis behind that and a, and a logic behind it. And maybe they got people to think uh, a bit differently about the trees on Michigan Avenue by describing them in um, economic terms rather than trees are, you know, true, good, beautiful, whatever. And, and yet it's really hard not to feel uneasy about seeding all the terms of, uh, of discussion about trees or OER to pure market capitalism. Um, it's, it's hard not to feel uh, you know, uneasy um, about that. And mm -hmm. I don't have a resolution for that contradiction, but I think it is, at, it is at the heart of some of the questions around sustainability. Right, right. So, um at, at Texas, we're actually having a conversation right now about the form about the role of MOOCs in the in the suite of offerings that the institution has available to it, and the value proposition of it in a number of different dimensions. Um, and we saw a slide earlier at the in, during the keynote about the, sort of the traditional value proposition statements around a MOOC, and um, in terms of reputation, in terms of of um, um, various, various, f at least attempted at connections between the engagement of students in MOOCs and some economic value uh, to the community or to the individual learner, et cetera. Um, but as was mentioned, this is something that the online learning community has been dealing with for quite some number of years. So I'm curious about some of the, the dimensions that c associated with online learning uh, value and its and the sustainability that is generated around that. And one happens to be around credit, which is something that MOOCs are now starting to be uh, starting to discuss. Does credit offer an avenue for online learning sustainability from the MOOC perspective as much as it has, in some fashion, for the, the traditional online learning space, as well as some of the liabilities associated with this. And one of those liabilities has to do with things like um, compliance with different. Um, uh, constraints around learning, and particularly around ADA compliance in the U.S., but, and for non-U.S. audiences for compliance associated with access uh, to the learning environment for those with disabilities. Um, and those are not areas that have been necessarily on the high priority list of many of the, of the MOOC uh, environments so far because they've been innovating in other ways. Um, and not necessarily as attentive, perhaps, as they could have been to, to, to that. So I'm curious, to, uh, and I'm open to any of you uh, raising your hand first about, about this, but I'm, I'm suspecting that, um, uh, that Marie has probably got something uh, you know, teed yeah, up suspect. for this one. Um, so how, how many people here are doing MOOCs, or your institutions, even if it's not you, and how many of your institutions are doing some form of online education? The, the other kind. Almost okay. overlapping. Yeah. Almost, yeah. So, boy, the, the, the question is kind of complex. If, you, if you've been doing what I will call traditional online education, that really sprang from um, a need for, it was really about access. And also the opportunity. We finally had this thing called the internet. But you know, I was, those of us who were involved in online since the mid-90s, we didn't do it because we wanted to get rid of buildings or we thought it was just cool to teach online. In fact, I thought it was the worst idea in the world when I heard that we were going to be teaching online because I loved teaching my students. I loved being in the room with them. And 
I remember, but remember I was teaching adults my entire life. I've been in adult higher education. And I remember talking to my dean and saying, I really want to teach one of these courses online because I want to be able to argue why we shouldn't do it. And then I did it. And it was, I mean, I'm, I can't believe what I probably put those poor students through because I didn't, who knew how to teach online? At, at, we had no models. We had no learning science about online education. But we learned how to do it. The students liked it. I started finding things to read. We got better and better at it. And now we have a pretty clear model. And we know about the ADA issues. We know what we need to do for students who actually might have, um, you know, a visual problem or need some so sort of support. We know about retention in online education in those courses. And we're, we're learning what to do about that. When MOOCs came along, and I'm certainly not criticizing them, uh, but my sense, and I don't think this is a private sense, was that uh, for those people who had not been doing online education, it was as though they discovered online education when the world of MOOCs came up, all right? And so those of us who had been doing it for a long time kind of said, well, welcome to the world of online education. But I don't think it was being viewed um, at, with the kind of development and the thinking that had been put in by institutions that were really trying to do online education in a credit-based world a certain way. Um, and uh, you know, some of the system schools uh, are, are other schools in the University of Maryland system. I can tell you, offered MOOCs because everybody else was. They didn't want to be left behind. And I think there was a lot of, well, I got to get out there and do a MOOC too because other peers in my category are doing MOOCs. So now, now we're coming you know, uh, to a point where I think institutions are asking, why are we doing MOOCs? And they, and they should. Um, just as I've always said, institutions should ask, why are you doing online education? I am not saying that online education is for every student group or for every university. I know it is a good model for our students. So uh, as we move, I think, into a mature phase of MOOCs, we're going to be asking the same questions and doing a lot of the same things that we've been doing for traditional online education. So now there's much more of a, of, of a thinking about how do we design MOOCs so students are really going to retain and learn? What kind of support has to be in those MOOCs, even if they're massive, so that students who really want that education can get that education and have the connection and the engagement? Um, we are now finally, we're, we are in the process as a system of really working with edX. And at UMUC, we really want to be involved with edX because we think they have some tools and some ways of approaching things that will now be a really good learning model for students. But to me, it's all about the learning model and the support. It's not really about the modality. Um, and I do believe there will be a time when MOOCs now start to become a very powerful form of education because you'll be able to segment students into smaller groups. You'll be able to give certain folks the kinds of support they need. There's data analytics involved, but it's not cheap. This whole idea that MOOCs were somehow going to educate masses of people for a very low uh, cost, it's crazy. It's going to be very expensive, but it's going to be really good for students. So I'm not sure if I totally answered the question, but. Well, I, I, I unpacked some. I mean, the one thing that I think is clear that, that MOOCs contributed and perhaps doesn't get uh, enough credit for what it has accomplished, and that is, um, and that is in the space of, of scale. Um, I mean, we've been doing online learning for a while, but as you pointed out in, in your courses, there were 30 student classes mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, the ability, both from a technical point of view, just to run stuff where classes have to be 100,000 students at a time, and there's and there's dozens, if not tens and hundreds of them at, uh, concurrently, um, was a technological enhancement of our understanding as much as anything else to enable us to have this question and discussion we're having now. And the questions about sustainability for an institution are often around, um, well, traditional institution sustainability comes from um, the cost associated with credits which are underwriting um, fac faculty salaries and, and various other things involved in it. Um, but they're also associated with meeting particular uh, missions uh, statements of institutions of one sort or another, 
in either their own area, in the state of Texas, for example, um, we have a, a commitment to um, particular emphasis on students from Texas. And, and so we haven't focused on the international audience particularly, um, even though the MOOC side of it has, the, the rest of the institution has not. And that's one of the, the, the contradistinctions that's being set up uh, in thinking about sustainability is, being, is forcing us to say, well, to what extent is what we're doing geographically constrained because of our funding from taxpayers, et cetera, um, versus versus not because of the value proposition of giving back to an audience that includes others outside of our tax base. So a couple of thoughts <clears throat> that came up um, while you were speaking. Uh, one, when, I, when I think about MOOCs, when I think about the massiveness, uh, the access that people, uh, that, that MOOCs provide, um, I can't help but think about the push over the last 20 to 30 years to get um, all students in developing countries in school. And the, I guess it's the last 15 years because these were the, um, the global development goals that were just renewed. The, the goal was to get everybody in school, to get butts in seats. Um, there was not a focus on learning. <laughs> and that has, and I'm, I'm speaking, ironic. it is ironic, but you know, it was, it was assumed that if you got students into school, that they would learn. And what much research has shown, and is becoming more and more apparent, um, is that in fact that's not the case in most places. That students who make it through seventh grade, a huge percentage of them are, are not even able to read. So yeah, they're going to school, but are they learning? So it's a question, so this is an analogy. I wonder, I wonder about, um, MOOCs, do I, do I think it's a good thing that all these students are in school? Absolutely, because now we have an opportunity, right? Stu students in these countries are now going to school. They're getting, they're getting used to the ritual and tradition of going to school and, and being taught, uh, but now it's a matter of, okay, so how do we help them learn? And I think the same question can be asked of, of MOOCs and, uh, and online education, and this got me thinking about the concept of, uh, so of, of online educational practice and open educational practice. So I, I support open educational resources, so I'll talk about that one. Open educational resources by themselves don't, don't do much for learning beyond giving people access. Some people can learn from those, self-motivated learners, people who um, can navigate that, sure. But the vast majority of people um, need good pedagogy, need good structure, need, need um, these things that actually take time to learn how to do and uh, I think we need to shift the conversation a bit away from access. What we need to sustain is pedagogy. What we need to sustain is, is good practice, whether it's in a brick and mortar classroom like this one, or whether it's online, um, or, or, or whether it's in a, in a massive environment. And that's hard, right? I think especially in a massive environment, that's a, that's a really hard thing to do. So, those are some of the thoughts I had as you were speaking about this, that, that there's, there's lessons to be learned from um, what's going on out there in the world already in Jeff? terms of access. There's a question out oh, here. Oh, sure. Okay? Yeah, absolutely, please. Wait, g give the, give the, um, the, the speaker, the person carrying the microphone, a chance to get to you. Uh, it's very interesting to uh, hear your comment about uh, uh, pedagogy, but not, uh, not necessarily just access. Uh, because we know uh, from data and also the uh, uh, fact that uh, all the uh, MOOCs that came online in the last five years, they promised a lot. And just like any other technology-driven initiative, the first time it's always rough. You learn that you, you know, don't really hit all your marks. And now there's a kind of the trough of disillusionment. Because yeah. just yesterday I was at a, 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 a VCPE EdTech meeting, and all of the investors there basically are down on MOOCs. They, none of them wanted to talk about it. None of them wanted to even do anything with it. So, but, the, but the core point is that it's a good thing to have. And now uh, a lot of uh, labs, like, like the lab that, that, that we're part of, uh, we're trying to develop uh, tools that increase the interactivity, 
uh, by building more lab-oriented activities inside these MOOCs. But now, with the private sector, especially because they've been putting a lot of capital in things that they perceive as not working, um, are pulling away from this. Uh, do you have a view to how foundations can step into this, uh, into, into, into this space? So the question is, is real, was over down here in the corner, please, response to that. Or, or maybe to add to that, I was thinking exactly the same thing. I mean, there are innovations, and in, for me, Western Governors is an example of one that spends a long time in that, I don't know that they were necessarily in the trough of disillusionment, but they went off the radar, and they took a long time to build up to what's now uh, a very active enterprise. So maybe thinking about it in terms of as foundations, you know, how do you think about funding innovations that are going to be in that, that trough of disillusionment for, for a much longer uh, extended period of time, but we feel are going to have that kind of, uh, that slope of uh, uh, enlightenment and get to that pro plateau of productivity. So he added that the amount of funding for these things to happen doesn't have to be very large. They're recording this, so I'll get that comment on there. Okay. Jim, do you want to tack? Uh, well, one quick comment, I guess, is there's always a tension or a contradiction in philanthropy between we're patient capital, we're responding to needs that the government won't fund and that the market won't address, and that's kind of the sweet spot for foundation money in some sense. And then on the other hand, uh, the Gates Foundation has a site called Impatient Optimists, right? And you know, you have to move on and cut your losses and, and you know, find the next promising thing and recognize when things aren't working. And that's why you know, evaluation is kind of a thing or one of the reasons why evaluation is a thing. You can begin to reflect honestly on what's working because you can uh, fool yourself that things are just about to start working and every program uh, you know, gets a constituency around it and you know, five or 10 years mm -hmm down a path, even if something isn't working, there are a lot of people who will tell you that it is, that it is or it's just about to. Um, and so that, that question of entry and exit from fields is one that I think um, cuts across everything in, in, uh, in philanthropy. I, I, well, I was just in response to that, I, I mean, one of the things that philanthropy has been purported as, as, as attempting to do is be that, that injection that allows um, a significant slope to be to rise to um, to be accelerated, and whether that slope is because you are at the nadir and can go back up again, or whether that slope is in the beginning of the curve, and uh, and and you have the opportunity of optimism to to, to drive it even higher, uh, it's still um, a positive delta, depending. In, and the only difference is at what point you're starting. Yes. Yeah, you're taking me back a bit um, to to my chemistry classes that I hated taking. Um, <clears throat> when we think about enzymatic reactions and, and the role of the enzyme in the, in the overall reaction, and, and when you think about ongoing reactions where, you're, <laughs> where you need that activation energy, and philanthropy has a very important role there. Sometimes government plays that role as well, but um, philanthropy is often more nimble in doing that. And, and, and if, you're, if what you're saying is true, that, that we're starting on a, on a, on a dip here <laughs> with um, the MOOC fervor, um, perhaps, perhaps there is a role there, but it would, it would have to be, I guess philanthropy would have to see the value in that. And, and, and it's helpful, this being on this panel has been helpful for me to think through some of these things that um, have to do with, you know, this, this, the, the analogy that I brought up about what, what, is it good that we have MOOCs going on? I mean, what's, wh whether, whether they're all doing what they promised to do or not, um, is there something that can be leveraged out of them? Is it, is, it, is it a jumping off point for an even greater reaction? And that, I think that's an important point to make. And, and perhaps there is a role um, for philanthropy to play there. When I think about um, the, what I focus on a bit more broadly than MOOCs with, with open educational resources in general, I consider myself to be a very boring funder. I fund infrastructure. And I don't, I don't do as much funding around innovation, though I'm moving there a little bit, but, but a lot of philanthropists don't like to fund infrastructure. And we see um, Hewlett started OER as a thing with its first grant to MIT for the open courseware and to UNESCO to get the definition and 
120 million dollars later, we're still funding OER uh, as a thing. And some foundations look at us and go, "What are you doing? <laughs> Why are you still doing this? <laughs> Where's the new there?" Yeah, yeah. Um, but what we're seeing is with with sustained funding for this thing that we believe in, that we believe has a promise, but the promise of OER is not open educational resources. The promise of OER, and I would say the same promise is for MOOCs, is open educational practice. It's what OER, what, what an open license and open access allows somebody to do that they cannot do in a closed environment. That, that's the promise we're shooting for. And so when, we, when I think about it in the long view, it's still in that we're still in that catalytic phase. We still, haven't, we still haven't peaked. There will come a point at which Hewlett will stop funding OER. I can't believe I just said that. It's probably, it's probably many, many years away. <laughs> it's definitely many, many years away because there's so much to do uh, still to get there. But the idea, and this is, I think, all philanthropy, there's always this idea that at some point, philanthropy's got to get out of the way or, you know, what are we doing? Right? That's, not, that's not how we work. So did, you had a follow-on question. Or comment. No, I agree with most of this. Uh, what what you, you were talking about? Um, Just most so, of it. <laughs> well, some, yeah, most of it. Okay. Just one or two things, but <laughs> it, no, that'll be too long to talk about. But uh, one thing that we could do that's very easy to do is actually um, quantify this goal. For example, today, if we take MOOC's biggest challenge is uh, course completion rates. It's between 5 and 10 percent, and it's been stuck there for the last three years. Um, if there are pedagogic tools, techniques, lab environments, et cetera, that could make that completion rate go to 20 percent, for example, within the next three years, that would be something that can very, be very easily be quantified. Well, and so, I, so even, so just la one last comment on that. So course completion rates, yeah, that's great, but I want to see evidence that completing a course actually is learning. I mean, that's, that's, that, I mean, and, and I think there's some assumption that if you complete the course, you'll learn, but that's the assumption that has been made in the developing world for over a decade now, is that if you complete seventh grade, you'll be able to read. And it, it, may, be, it may be true that course completion, now that's a first step, obviously you need to get course completion going, but looking beyond that, you, you need to look at, we need to look at, we need to figure out how to look at learning, actual Can learning. I, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I also want to add to that, um, so we also, you know, I really like to look at root cause analysis because you could, you could run into, we have to do different pedagogy, which I agree, we have to look at that, very important. But it could be still that most of the people signing up for, for these courses, for these MOOCs, are just sort of dabbling. And um, until there's really something at the end of it that they really want, they're not gonna be motivated. So I would say we still have to unpack the question, and I'm not a funder, but if I were a funder, I would ask that question. Look, our students are motivated to finish their traditional online courses because they're getting credits towards a degree. And until we have something like that underlying MOOCs, and I think you know, the move from audacity to um, moving into the training world, their retention is probably going way up because of that. So there's gotta be a goal at the end of this. And then good learning. So, I mean, this is an interesting, uh, juxtaposition, because it's in some sense marks the, the collision between the traditional online environment and what the MOOCs brought to the table. Because they brought not only scale and size and all of that, but they also brought this notion of um, um, learning for the sake of, of interest and without necessarily driven by some sort of, of certified ending that was not just a certified ending in most cases is in, not, in continuing in online education, but those were credits and courses towards even something else, whether it was a certificate or a degree or something like that, which leads to the question of assessment and the context of assessment in, in the online space, um, not just for online traditional continuing education, but also for, for MOOCs, because one of the things that's holding back some players in this space is um, a perception that whatever is going on in the online space um, really, really isn't sufficiently rigorous to be able to assert learning, because the assessments behind them um, are fraught with uh, possibilities of, of fraud or, or other things that give you uncertainty as to whether or not the learner behind the keyboard is the learner and, and the rest of it. 
Um, but I'd like to, if, if Shiguru has a comment you'd like to follow up with on this, you're welcome to, to do so. So we'll go first to that. Um, I'd like to go back to Marie's first comment that we cannot depend on foundations to sustain. And uh, uh, TJ and Jeff's uh, uh, comment that foundations fund innovation. So uh, I'm Shigeru Miyaga from MIT and uh, University of Tokyo. So it was because of the Hewlett funding and Mellon Foundation that we were able to start Open Courseware. Without that funding, uh, Open Courseware would have been this weird idea that sat on the shelf and collected dust, and nothing uh, would c come out of it. Okay. Uh, and uh, we have been able to somehow sustain it. Now, uh, I think we are in our 15th year. Okay. Um, what I worry about is that uh, uh, you know, ideas uh, get into societies over a long term. George, George talked about that. 40 years for electricity, you know, maybe 20 years for personal computers. Uh, uh, I, so uh, how do these ideas get sustained? Uh, as far as I can see, there are two uh, reasons. One is financial. Electricity is financial, and the other uh, for educational uh, ideas that it reflects the mission of the institution. Okay, a land grant university has a mission to reach its state, uh, it, its uh, audience within the state uh, in the best way possible, and online education is one way to do that. So, uh, land grant institutions are actively and successfully doing online education. Uh, with MOOCs, uh, it's uh, it's not so clear. Uh, Marie uh, said, you know, when you he, uh, talk to people, why are you doing MOOCs? It's because anyone who's, who, everyone who's anyone is doing it. And this is what I hear. Uh, and faculty members have an attention span of about five years. You know, this is our sort of funding cycle for I would have said much shorter, research. but okay. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, where, how do we um, sustain if those are the two, either financial, uh, and MOOCs are supposed to be free, okay? or directly reflecting the mission of the university. Okay? How do we figure that out? We haven't done so yet, but I think it's critical at this point, as we see sort of the cooling off of the excitement uh, to figure this out, if we're going to take advantage of all the wonderful things that are coming up. If panel, would you like to re respond and, right, and bring the microphone to the middle? Well, uh, you know, I'll take a crack at that. I, I couldn't agree more about the mission piece. And, you know, I, I think it's important always to go back to mission and what your institution's fundamental mission is. And so many of us get into mission creep, and we start doing everything, all things to all people. And that's not a good use of our resources. But it's easier said than done, because there are many great ideas out there, and we all love to be chasing them. And actually, five years is a great attention span. You know, my president has, and I love him dearly, but his attention span is like two minutes. So, you know, don't president, do that. yeah, don't do that. But pre, you know, presidents love new ideas. But um, I think if you can keep coming back to your mission and coming back to your mission, there are things we have to say no to. And so, honestly, I think some some presidents and provosts should have said. Until we think through why we're going to do a MOOC, we shouldn't do a MOOC. Uh, until we know why we're doing online education in the traditional sense, we're not going to do it. Uh, until we know why we need another classroom building, we shouldn't build it. But boy, is, does that go against American higher education. If you get the money for it, and you know, if you're the new president, you need a new building, you need a new program. Uh, it's very, very difficult. But, until we start doing that, and I actually think some of the financial pressures that institutions are feeling might actually force uh, leadership to do that more. It, it's going to be really important to do that. You got to stick to what you're really good at. Doesn't mean you shouldn't innovate, but do it within the context. Uh, we're, we're, you know, as you were talking about um, innovation, I think the other thing is you're seeing a proliferation of innovation units now, and. Again, I think there's a little bit of being copycat, but because everybody thinks it's really cool to have a vice president for innovation. But I think the schools that really figure out how to make it part of their structure and their culture, um, will, we will see that moving. And, and you won't need as many foundation grants to kickstart things, because we've got to figure out how to help our culture in higher ed 
actually think of continuous improvement, which is sometimes antithetical. You know, we have traditions and it's always been this way, but as you learn new ways of helping students learn, we've got to figure out how to get them into the implementation. Um, and, and I think that will then sustain it moving forward. Jeff? Um, so one of the things I, I would like to pose a question too. It seems that one of the things that's happened with MOOCs and open educational resources over the last 15 years is it's kind of moved from are you crazy to oh, of course, right? And it's broadly accepted in um, many, many institutions. And I'm wondering if the character of resistance to MOOCs inside the places that you're working has changed. And if you start to think about things in, in that way, you know, maybe that leads on to the next you know, the next set of iterations around, um, around MOOCs. Um, the other thing that strikes me is that when you have uh, a new medium like MOOCs, it, it's typical that, you know, vaudeville is the first thing that's put on TV. And I think that was true with, with MOOCs and online learning environments. And I'm wondering how you see the next iteration of, of media evolution affecting uh, your institutions or your institutional missions. Um, Maybe it's an unfair two-part question, but it's one, what is the resistance you're getting, and, and two, how is the evolution of media related to that? Uh, well, I think, I think Shigeru has raised a, an interesting um, and important um, question of alignment, yeah. and that is if your in institutional culture and mission is around, has innovation as a part of it, then it's much easier for the, for the work that's going on in MOOCs to find a home, um, because you can use it for ways if, for uh, practices that are difficult to manage in the confines of the traditional uh, academic structures that we have. Um, and one of the things that comes to mind is, is um, the way in which uh, experimentation with pedagogical practice can be done in a MOOC environment, um, which is harder to do, at least in the US, in the traditional online environment, where if you classify a, a learner as a student, in the traditional institutional context of a student who is paying and getting certain things in return, um, then there are constraints um, the, around the extent to which you can be uh, creative in, um, in engaging in pedagogical practice. Um, that there's a certain sense of contract and obligation of delivery on that contract when in a research context and experiment, the reason you're doing the experiment is you don't know the outcome, yeah. right? And so if you don't know the outcome, you're trying to do it with students, and you tell them this is something we're doing, we're not sure of the outcome. If you want to participate, then, then stay on. If you don't, then drop out. That's difficult to do in a, in a traditional credit-based environment where there is supposed to be a return regardless uh, of what's going on. That's interesting. Uh, but, Yes, it, first there's so a question I there. actually have a question sort of regarding this idea of institutional mission. Now, I'm coming from a small private liberal arts school, so a lot of what we end up working with is alumni and alumni donations. So the sort of question here is, how is that gonna play into future funding and future funding ideas? Because I know we're talking a lot about how grants can't sustain us, but I mean, what is the idea here of where we can get alumni involved in sort of the pedagogical innovation process and say, so this is the great education we were able to give you 50 or 20 or 30 years ago, we want to continue to sustain that sort of idea, that sort of model, but we can't do that in this new environment. So is that sort of the, a possibility, a new way of opening up an avenue of funding for this innovation at at least certain types of institutions? I mean, okay, I'll, I'll dive in. I mean, one of the points I wanted to make uh, earlier was just about the diversity of um, funders that are out there. So you will probably persuade um, some alumni with that perspective. But there are 80,000 foundations in the US right now, and there are a lot of new ones, um, a lot of big ones, a lot of multi-billion dollar endowed foundations are spinning up over the next, over the last five and over the next 15 years. I think we're going to see the um, landscape change a lot. And I think we'll also see um, some shift towards projects relying um, on larger numbers of funders rather than a single supporter. It may be the alumni network, which I guess is traditional in education, but it may be other um, large groups of people that are providing, that are answering the sustainability question rather than um, one institution. I think Candace had uh, wanted to respond to your question, Jeff. Hey, um, Candace. I saw her throwing it. Great. <laughs> oh, okay, I just, I just want to give you that chance. 
Go ahead and get the mic there, and then we'll bring, can bring it back over to here. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah, this was the question about um, Resistance. that Phil was answering. And I want to say sort of what will keep them sustained, at least in a research university, I think they have the potential of changing the relationship between learning research and teaching practice. I mean, okay. we sit here in a teacher's college, and one of the challenges that has beset educational researchers for decades is we're doing all this great research, we're finding out all this great stuff, and it has no impact or little impact on practice. The thing that's great about massive open online courses is we can, build, if we were to start building them based on what we already know about how people learn, and then introduce the kind of experimentation that Phil was talking about, you can do rapid A-B testing in these environments to not build necessarily new theory, but refined theory and then have an instanti instantiation of that learning design in a technology which makes it immediately transferable to new contexts. So what I get really excited about with MOOCs is the change in practice that TJ is talking about, not just the change in teaching practice, but the change in practice between the relationship between learning researchers and teaching practitioners. Because you get its continuous cycle of feedback. And that's, that's, what's, that's what I think, I hope, is going to be the next phase of MOOCs. So Very MOOCs exciting. aren't a publishing system. They're an observational instrument, in a sense. They're both. They're both. And they're I both. Think what, and, what's they, and, and what's great about it, too, is then it's a real opportunity to have the faculty or the teachers who are teaching in the disciplines, the chemists, the biologists, the historians, who don't know a lot about how learning happens, partnering with the learning researchers to co-create these environments so that they both reflect the depth of expertise in the content area, which is what they do now, but also reflect the depth of expertise in teaching and learning practice. So that, I just I want to I want to I just want to underline and bold and italicize what you just said, uh, 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 because getting at teacher practice is an extremely high touch endeavor, yeah. and you know. Pontificating about research, sending it out, it, it, it does not get there because that's a low touch distribution. Um, the, the promise of things like MOOCs uh, for that very thing is really exciting. Yeah, and mostly because what, if you design them right, what they can do is give that teacher amazing amounts of insight into their student's knowledge state at, at a time when they can use it instead of after the midterm or after the final is over. But we have to start designing MOOCs differently and providing that analysis and real-time insight to teachers. And then I've seen it happen. Teaching practice changes. It changes from just this purely intuitive, oh, I always talk about this on week three, to getting insight into this is a concept I care about and where are my students struggling. So today when I teach, since I know how they're struggling, I'll do something different. Okay, and you here. move to evidence-based practice. So anyway, oh, over I here? I'm not supposed to be presenting here, but <laughs> it's my natural. Thank you for joining us. Sorry. Oh, yeah, I should say who I am. Uh, I'm Candace Still. Um, I was the founding director of the Open Learning Initiative at Carnegie Mellon University, and now I'm at Stanford uh, University in the Graduate School of Education. Hi, I'm Jen French, and I am at MIT, and I make MOOCs. Um, and I also use. On, I manage the math department's use of online tools residentially as well, where we also use the Open edX platform. And I think that for us, we really want to see the content itself becoming self-sustaining. We really do view this as the next, as a disruptor of publishing, and we want it to be that. We want this to be something that people can then take and use in their teaching practice in innovative ways, in a way that provides them data about what their students are doing and how they're doing it. And, and for us, we really want to see the MOOC as, yes, it's expensive, yes, it takes manpower, but it's sort of, it's crowdsourced editing. It's, it does provide a huge amount of data, and it does provide a huge amount of marketing. There is this value in that, but that maybe it's a step towards the end product rather than the end product itself. I ran a MOOC this summer, and um, of the teachers that were in the course, 85% of them said that it, our course changed the way they would teach calculus the next time they taught it. And, but, and 
we had loads of comments on the discussion forum, well, how can I use your content? And right now, the answer is, you can't. <laughs> And I think that if, in terms of sustainability, we need to find ways that we can sell the content to these people who can use it and can be teaching people face to face as well. And if you don't, and I guess right now I'm hearing a lot of things about, well, foundations can't fund this forever. The universities need to just fund this forever. But is that really practical either? And I think that I'm not alone in thinking of this as being sort of publishing in a new wave. Are there other ideas that you have of how this content can become self-sustaining? So can I respond to that? I think that the idea of selling content um, needs to change. This is, this is obviously something I'm very passionate about, that, um, that we shouldn't be asking people to pay for content anymore. Um, there's so many other things that we should be asking people to pay for. And that gets at the core of pedagogy. We should be providing professional development to faculty. Faculty who get zero training in how to teach in their discipline. That's an example. So this is happening in K-12. In K-12, the big publishers are getting away from content. They're not, going, they're not moving toward content. They're moving away from it. And what they're moving toward is providing high quality professional development for educators about how to use that content well. I don't think that's quite happening yet in higher ed, and I don't know what the appetite would be for that in higher education. But it's, it's, a, it's certainly something to contemplate. And when you make, when you reduce the friction, so you, talk, you talked about want, faculty wanting to innovate and adapt and co-edit um, that can happen most effectively in an, in an open environment. When content is openly licensed, so people know what they can do with it and what they can't do with it, um, it's very clearly marked that way. That's a first step, right? That's a legal barrier gone. There's friction reduced for actually achieving this idea of open educational practice and use. And, and then there are technical barriers that need to be eliminated as well. Those are separate aspects of openness. So sure, but how are you going to pay for the creation of that content? But, well, that's, that is the question. And that's, that's a really important question. And that's, that, that gets at the heart of sustainability. This is the question that we do think about, you know. Well, so one of the things that, I mean, let me step in and just say that there have been, in the same way there are crowdsourced activities associated with, um, with funding uh, innovations, for example, with sites that you all know of that begin with the word kick or something like that. Um, there are people that are actually putting out uh, their educational content for um, a dollar a lesson or, or something along those lines, just individual teachers on various, various platforms. And the idea is if there's enough of an interest in their, their stuff, that will help at least contribute to the, the creation process and the creation cost. Uh, it takes a huge market to do that. Um, but at least we're starting to see some of the inverse um, funding processes that um, have been around for, for, uh, for high cost innovation experiments now being democratized, if you will, with individual teachers putting up lessons for, forgive the, the market speak, but for a micropayment kind of um, uh, charges. And it's generating, in some instances, enough money for them to think that this is a, a worthwhile endeavor. But I want to go quickly over here to the, to the woman who's got a, a, the microphone in her hand. Um, my name is Ursula Wolls, and um, I've come home. I was a graduate student here at Teachers College until um, 1985 when the computing and education program was first started. I was one of its first graduates, and I also have a degree in artificial intelligence from that big institution across the street, um, a PhD. And I've been looking at education and computing and technology um, since I was an undergrad at MIT. So I, you know, there are my creds. I also quit being a full-time academic five years ago because I was at an institute, an undergraduate institution where there was no way we were going to compete with MOOCs. And we were told by our provost that we were all replaceable by machines. Um, and so I've been on this mission for a few years. And at first I thought I was going to fight with you, but I'm on the same page. I am, and I've been a curriculum developer at the moment in order to pay my mortgage so my daughter can get through her middle class school. 
At the same time, I'm in a community, um, a very wealthy one, where there is effectively no ed computer, computer science education K-12, mm -hmm. okay? And so Catch-22 I'm in is everybody wants me to volunteer my time to help get things up to speed, and we actually did that, and we parlayed it into some wonderful work that's gotten some national recognition. But the, the VCs and the angel investors don't want to touch us because we're providing a service, okay? And the foundations don't want to touch us, although I will buttonhole both of you at lunch if I can to sort this out, um, because we're not <coughs> doing innovation. We're trying to create a sustainable mo model. And the tail end of my story is that I'm not sure that the MOOC technology is appropriate, because I was at Grinnell last week and I met four wonderful women, young, young undergraduates. One was from China, one was from Vietnam, one was from Russia, and one was from Tanzania. And they were part of the, you know, <coughs> let's go out there and let's reach everyone. And what I learned from these incredibly talented women um, who were succeeding at Grinnell in one of the most rigorous computer science programs and well-endowed computer science programs in the country is that they learned, they cut their teeth <coughs> in computer science on technology from the 80s. And for those of you in the know, they all came in 2013 and 14 to Grinnell having learned Pascal. And for those of you who don't know, we gave up on that language 15 years ago, okay? So it's like saying that Latin is a modern language, okay? And it, you'll get credit for it. Um, and so within that context, here's my concern. Um, we can focus on the technology and we can focus on the research, but what you all are saying or what, what's being said, which truly bothers me given my background, is that the kind of pedagogy that occurs in a face-to-face -face classroom is automatically transferred when you have it work through the screen. And I wouldn't have brought this up except Sherry Turkle just put out a book um, that was publicized all over the New York Times that through her research says when you talk through this machine or the little ones, rather than face to face, you don't develop empathy. Okay, so we come full circle. So, um, yes, who builds the content? But more to the point, how are we gonna take what happens magically in a classroom? And I've won awards for being a teacher. I've gotten NSF funding for doing, you know, doing an innovation in computing and education. But how do we take the face to face? without having an entire body of people become our research guinea pigs, okay? My daughter has two and a half years left in high school, and I'm trying to help her and her friends get the computing education that they need in order to function at any university in this country, okay? I can't wait three years. So I, I, don't, I don't want people to misunderstand. I certainly don't want you to misunderstand that, that we believe that I believe, and that the Hewlett Foundation believes that anybody should be producing content for free. We've invested $120 million and the bulk of that has gone into content production. Figuring out the question of how to make content production, open content production sustainable is a huge question. And some ideas that have come um, recently, and it's not an answer question yet, for sure. And, and I don't think I can answer it right now. Though I think that one thing I want to say about that is that I believe we need to shift away from the royalty-based content model. I believe that we need to shift toward a greater emphasis on faculty producing content as their job. And that's going to require a shift in the way, the, what's, what's valued at institutions. And she's shaking her head and saying, that will never happen. So. Well, but so these are the sorts of things, if you want to ask like what, what foundations are interested, it's in tackling those kinds of problems. That's not an easily solvable or a near-term solution, but if we really, if we really envision a world where, where teaching is as important as research, which, gasp, uh, it's, it's going to take some work to get there, but, but that's... That's sort of the solution I see. And I don't know if it's enough to sit back and say, well, that can't happen, so we can't do it, so let's not do it. Um, that, I mean, that's, that's a larger philosophical debate we can have. But I just want to make no bones about the fact that I don't think people like you, itinerant curriculum developers, I think you're incredibly important and, and should be valued more, not less. Um, but I, I don't know that the answer is to do that in a traditional market way where 
where students bear the burden of that cost. That's, that's the concern that I have. Uh, and that's sort of the, the broader push we're trying to make with open educational resources and whether MOOCs are open or not. Um, and, and how we get there is, is a different question. So I guess I would just respond that way. I'm not going to respond to the computing education piece. That's a different question. Yeah. Somebody has and, it. and I Marie. just, hi, hi, Candace. Well, let me just say one thing and then you can jump in. Um, so at public universities, like our system is talking about perhaps building a, a consortium uh, so that we can actually have faculty developing content and sharing it with each other. So I think it's hard for any one institution to do it, but if you can become part of consortia, systems, did I read your mind? Yeah. We, we, I mean, open is open, so we have to be sharing it. But, you know, TJ's right. We, we really can't sit here and say, well, it's never going to happen, so it's never going to happen. There have to be some fundamental shifts somewhere, or you're right, it's never going to happen. Um, I think look at public systems and look at states that are underfunded by the state. They have to be very creative and they're doing some interesting things. Can I just point out one? I just had it written down three times on my paper to point out. If you haven't heard of the, o the OER Universitas, has anybody heard of the OERU? One person's heard of the, two people have heard of the OERU. This is an example of a, of a group of institutions from around the world. I think they're up to 35 partner institutions. Um, Moscow, um, South Africa, started in New Zealand. It's a grantee of ours, but the whole point of this was that they have a goal of working together and contributing in kind um, one course each toward a general ed program. Um, that will be funded based on assessments. So I'm going to come back to that as well at some point. But, but the idea is that they're shifting, as a, as a group, they're shifting a bit um, in a small step for the, each of these institutions. It's a small step, but they are contributing content. They're paying, they're paying for the content themselves into a collective that then students can um, receive credit. And most of these are the most disadvantaged students in the world. We're not talking about students in general, we're talking about students who would never have the opportunity to go to college, can actually come and complete a college degree for under $1,000. Uh, and, and so that's an ex it's just an example of one. And it, they're still figuring it out. It's very experimental. They're trying to figure it out. But it's a, right. it's a stab at trying to shift the status quo and to get people to do things that they haven't done before. And anyway. So um, time check as moderator. We have about, um, about 12. No, about seven minutes left in the in the session. So I want to give one or one or two more questions. We've got two here and a third there, and I think we'll stop at that. And then I want to give the panelists an opportunity while that's going on to be thinking about a short one, you know, forty-five second um, uh, final closing comment or observation. Um, and then we will um, we will break. So first over here in the in the audience. Sure. Yeah. So I just I want to quickly affirm the importance of um, where this pressure for this con this shift from this content model is going to happen. And I think it is happening now. And it's happening from the bottom from students, and it's happening from the outside from employers. And I think you see something like the movement to competency based education, which if you thought there was a bloody battle for learning objectives, wait till this comes in. Um, <laughs> but this is not something that is going to come from within the system, and it's not something that people are necessarily going to go willingly, willingly toward. However, when you have two out of three of the factors, so the students themselves asking the very good questions you are asking, which is, what is the purpose? What is the mission? Why am I here in this place and learning this thing, and what can I do with it? When you have those people, as well as the people who are saying, are you ed what are you educating them to do for us? I think that that pressure will make um, as... Um, George Siemens had in his excellent talk this morning talk about that points of how that change can happen. So I think that's, I just want to affirm what you were saying about where the shift needs to happen. Okay. Timo? Hi, Timo Kos from Delft University in the Netherlands. I think um, you mentioned already that the shift um, is happening. Um, in Delft, we own the IP of everything our teachers and researchers produce on content side. So that's makes it easier to publish it as a, a, a open courseware. Um, but I, th I think the point to be collaborating is, is spot on, because on your own, it's very hard to produce content uh, rich enough to use on your own, uh, um, in your own education. So I think we should collaborate there. Um, but it is already happening, and it is possible. We, we're a publicly funded university, so maybe we have a different background than some of the other uh, universities here. But you can publish all your content open, licensed. And, and, and Timo, uh, 
is the collaboration you're talking about via the Open Education Consortium, is that one of those that I know Delft is heavily involved in? Yes, we are, but I think we'll need uh, some institutions that are willing to go further than that um, and to really share your investment in producing content together. Um, if you could create, for example, for us, it would be very helpful if we have a, a math curriculum, content for a fully uh, um, f a full uh, uh, academic math curriculum. It's, it's used in all our engineering courses, and now it's not there. We have published a lot of open content, but there's there's still gaps there. So you cannot build uh, your your teaching on that. You cannot fill a, a digital learning environment with that. Okay. And. Uh, Go ahead. Go. I can Please. go ahead? Yep. OK, so I'm Fiona Hollands from Teachers College. A couple of things. Um, I'm completely confused about the sustainability issue, and I'm not quite sure why learners shouldn't pay for an educational experience. But one thing I haven't heard talked about at all, and I'm wondering why, is the role of the government and the taxpayer. Like, what is their role in this? So I don't know if anybody would like to speak to that. And then the other question I have, um, Marie, TJ, Candice, a number of people have talked about all this wonderful knowledge that we have about uh, online education. What are the top three resources that you could point us all to that we should be using or funders should perhaps be promoting as to what all MOOC providers and producers should be using to design their educational experiences? Okay. Uh, I'll go really fast. Uh, so I wasn't arguing, I can't speak for, but I don't know that we were arguing for not paying for an educational experience. But I think the conversation was about not necessarily paying for the very high cost of textbooks. In my, at my institution, our students are not, uh, they are adults, they have very um, difficult lives. It is hard for them to pay their tuition, let alone their textbooks, which if you've looked at them, we all know this, they're going up faster than any, any other segment. That's about the access issue. It's not the, the experience that we're talking about. Um, I, one of the things I could recommend is there's a wonderful organization that the Sloan Consortium supported for years called, it used to be called Sloan C, it is now called the Online Learning Consortium. And they're, they are really focused on, uh, and I'm on the board of this, focused on research and good and best practice in terms of online education and certainly MOOCs, although there's a lot of, well, it, that, that would be a great place, at least that I think. Yeah, so I would, I would second that I don't think anybody's made the argument that learners shouldn't pay for a learning experience. Um, so when we think about the cost of education, and that really hasn't been a conversation much today, um, it's more about access and pedagogy, but there are certain costs where the market is broken, uh, and textbooks is one of them. So that's a focus that we have in open educational resources. But um, on, on the question, I think an excellent question of what, where, where I would point people to, um, one conversation we've had, one thing that was brought up was related to accessibility. And this is for online education, for MOOCs, and for just teaching in, in general. general. Yeah, um, but there, there are some good resources there. There's a new toolkit out, um, out of British Columbia um, from BC campus, which is sort of a CTL for the entire uh, province um, that you could look at, which is an accessibility toolkit. Um, and there are a few others of those as well. So I would point you to that. Um, I'd also point to Peter Kaufman, uh, who's sitting right here, who's actually working on, um, I don't know if I can tell the title of it, already, but it's, it's the Columbia Guide for Digital Media or Video, Moving Pictures. What is it, Peter? What's the title? Is there a working title? Columbia, Ma Columbia Manual of Video Style. The Columbia Ma Manual of Video Style, which, which um, is going to address a lot, of these, a lot of these issues around effective production, both the technical aspects, pedagogical ones as well. So that would be one that doesn't exist yet, but it's, it's in process. If Peter weren't sitting right here, he'd be writing on it right now. Yeah. Um, I, I think this question that we set out to answer with this panel of who pays and why and what's sustainability and what's the future of sustainability, I, I don't know that we have answered that. I think sustainability maybe means don't ask for money again. Um, sometimes it's a, a translation to making um, payment someone else's problem. I do think that there's a lot of parallel there are parallel systems to MOOCs that you can look at if you want to get a, a sense of what, what might happen. You can look at uh, scholarly journals and you can look at university presses and you can even look at, at newspapers and music and every other kind of traditional 
type of media that's come online, there's usually a pretty big shift in the flows of money. It's not that there aren't flows of money in the educational system, but there is a real question about how they're allocated. Right. So we have, uh, we've reached actually a minute over our time frame. Um, so uh, what I think I will do is um, I'll make two observations and then um, and let the panelists off the hook for the, for the rest. Um, one is uh, that I think came out interestingly here is the importance of sustainability in terms of mission alignment of, the, of our institutions. Mm -hmm. Things will be sustainable to the extent to which the institutions see themselves in the, as having value and importance in sustaining it. Um, and so in one hand, that might be in the guise of the research direction, where those that are research institutions see this as an opportunity to do uh, a contribution that is squ squarely in their mission. And those that are more service oriented, they may see this as a mechanism for um, trying to provide an educational experience that is um, that is rich and diverse and is as inexpensive as, and accessible as possible. Um, the second is in. Um, is in the, um, the question that was raised about, is pedagogy actually um, from the classroom transferable to online environments? And I think that we have um, failed to answer that question, in part because we failed to ask it. Um, and I think the conversation that we heard from George this morning in this keynote was uh, precisely that, an opportunity and a request that people consider how do we actually bring um, broader social value and empathy back into our, as a, as a primary element in our pedagogical process and as a measured outcome of pedagogical activities. Because if it isn't an outcome measure, then no one's gonna bother to, uh, to, to pay attention to it and no one's gonna fund it. Um, so I'd like to thank the panelists for their, on, for their time and their, and their, and their uh, observations and thank all of you for the conversations that you brought to this, which made it a much richer discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's lunch.